We good, John? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's one of those people you never see that make the world go round. <laughs> Paul Rhodes in in Berlin, playing three acts by Robert Holmes and Barclay. Act one. Scene one. Essie is standing in front of the oven, busily basking a cooked dish. When we hear a knock at the door, Essie does not hear the knocking on the front door and continues to pass. Madeline, who is wearing a raincoat, gently nudges the door open and sticks her head inside the room. Hello? Is anyone home? Oh, hi, <laughs> Madeline. I didn't hear you knocking. Come on in. I just love your stairs. Aren't they wonderful? <laughs> They're like the creaking, winding stairs of some medieval castle, and at the top of them, instead of a dungeon, is this beautiful apartment with the smell of a Mm. What are you cooking? I'm roasting duck. Yes, yes. <laughs> the smell of duck roasting with such love and cheer. That's why I got this apartment, you know. It's different, you know, and it has character. Goodness. I mean, did some Duke or Lord once live here? <laughs> Not that I know of. Only Paul, who is royalty enough. <laughs> but don't tell him that. He believes he's working class, not just a common man. Well, the Welsh miners do love him. And the dock workers at Cardiff, and the steel workers in Birmingham, and the textile spinners in Manchester. They all go crazy when they hear his folk songs. So, how are you coping with his success? I'm coping for, for better or worse. We've had our, our tough times, though. I heard. Right now, things are going well, and, and I'd like to keep it that way. Have you adjusted to living here in Britain? Yes, but I love New York City, Harlem more, you know. That's where I really want to live. Paul prefers here because it doesn't have as much race prejudice than the loneliness he feels in America. He calls London his home now, and well, if it makes him happy, then. Oh, and your little boy, how is he? Paulie, he's fine. He's with his grandmother now in Switzerland. They'll be coming back here next month. Goodness, it must be difficult raising a child. Well, my mother is with him most of the time, thank goodness. I can barely keep up with my own life. She opens the other door and basks in the dark. She's a better mother than me. By the way, where is the big man? I've got more great news. Oh. I have a letter from Sergei Eisenstein, the famous Russian filmmaker. You mean the Sergei Eisenstein who made the battleship? Potemkin and Strike in October, yes. Oh, Sergei Mikhailovich, as he prefers to be called. <laughs> well, Paul would love to hear that. I expect him any minute. You're welcome to wait for him. Well, what's in the letter? <laughs> he is inviting Paul to come to Russia to star in a movie he wants to make. Or rather, he is inviting him to discuss the possibility. Well, that's fantastic. Can I see it? Why don't you stay and have dinner? Oh, no, 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 I don't want you to have it. Nonsense. Paul is going to have questions for you anyway, so you might as well stay. Well, that duck does smell of flea fighting. My dear Robeson, I never had the opportunity to meet you, and I was always sorry of it because you were one of the personalities I always liked without having known them personally. <laughs> Did he write this himself? <laughs> yes! No translator. I think it's pretty good for someone just beginning to learn English. <laughs> now I am extremely pleased to hear from my friend Madeline that you got interested in our country and the problems which run around it all over the world. But well, what's he talking about? I mentioned to him that Paul was getting interested in the African liberation movements and that he was beginning to learn Russian. Did you go to Moscow to see Eisenstein? Yes. I went there to interview him for a biography I'm going to write. I am a very close friend. <laughs> as soon as you'll be in this country, we will have the opportunity to talk at last, and we will see if finally we will get to do something together. Well, I don't understand what kind of movie he wants to make at all. Essie, he wants to make a talkie based on the life of Tristan Novatour, the Haitian revolutionary. Oh, 
For years now, Sergei has been dying to make the film. The fact that a black man organized a whole army that defeated Napoleon intrigues Sergei. Basically, Sergei wants Paul to play the lead role of Toussaint. <laughs> he has the complete backing of the Russian commissar of film and as well as the entire Russian government. But when is he wanting to come? Us, I see. The invitation is for both of you. <laughs> In December. December? <laughs> well, that's too soon. I, I, I think he needs an, an I need more time. You see, you've got to get Paul to do it. It will be the experience of a lifetime. All your expenses will be paid by the Russian government. A hotel, transport, food, everything. All the top Russian leaders in culture and politics will be in attendance. Oh, they are going to go all out, believe me. But is it safe to go now? Oh, yes. Now is the perfect time to go. The country is at peace. Stalin is in firm control. There's some trouble in the countryside with the peasants, but Moscow is perfectly safe. They're rebuilding the city with modern skyscrapers and new subway system. I know, my, my two brothers are in Russia, actually. Oh, really? What do they do? My brother John is working as a mechanic, and, and Frank is a member of some wrestling team in the circus. <laughs> Many American Negroes are there. No, there's, there's no racism in Russia. <laughs> the Soviets have passed laws against discrimination, which are vigorously enforced. I'm sure your brothers will tell you that. Oh, Essie, you Paul will have the time of your lives. to give to Sergei. Not that you need it, but it might help. I was so excited about his invitation, I just had to write it. <laughs> oh, that's also a very personal message from me to him. <laughs> and the lights fade. <laughs> Scene two. A couple of hours later, they are both seated. They are eating dinner, sitting at a dining table. Both women are on either side of halls. On the table are plates, wine bottle, glasses, from the looks of it, they have finished eating the main course. All takes the wine bottle and pour it more in both Essie and Madeline's glasses. And I was trying to reach a very low note. Then all of a sudden, I had a tooth! <laughs> I sneezed right in the middle of the song. And I looked at the king and the queen sitting up in the balcony. And they did bat an eye. <laughs> A moment passed, and then someone in the audience yelled, Kuzuntai! <laughs> and everyone laughed! <laughs> so I continued singing despite the flu. <laughs> Even after all that, they gave me a standing ovation in several person courts. Oh, oh, it is such a great song. Every time I hear it, I get goosebumps. Oh, could you sing a couple of lines for me after dinner, please? Nice. Yes. Not on your life. Oh. I mean, everywhere I go, people ask me to sing it. I mean, it is a great song, but give it a rest. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of my favorites of Paul's, I must confess. I like his folk songs a lot more. That's why I like to perform in the provinces. So I can sing these songs in the language and dialect of the people who live there. Is that why you're studying Russian? Yes. Uh. But I'm also studying Chinese and African Swahili. See, these are the places where I want to travel and sing. Well, you know, I, I feel like I'm getting here. Hmm. Paul started out singing spirituals, but now he's trying to expand to an international audience. You see, once I learned the language of a people and feel a truly personal connection to them, then I turn to Essie for cultural context and history. <laughs> you know, she studied for a PhD in anthropology at the London University. No, I did not know that. That's wonderful, Essie. Why didn't you tell me? Well, let me clarify. I'm, I'm trying to study, you know, but I'm not learning a terrible amount. It's true, I help Paul, but we help each other. Anthropology is so terribly imperialistic, and, and it assumes that any culture outside of Europe is savage and backward. Still, just quite the achievements. What you both are doing, and that you are doing it together, I, I don't know, it sounds like a new story to me. Dessert, anyone? We have sweet potato pie. Oh, no, 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 I'm stuffed. That was excellent, Doc. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you like it. <laughs> 
So, um, madam, how are we going to get to Moscow? I mean, what is the best way of traveling? Uh, uh, does this mean that you've accepted Sergei's offer? That I can write to him and definitely tell him that you're coming? Of course, I want to go. I mean, uh, unless Essie objects. It's a great idea, but I think December is too soon. Too soon? I, I mean, I, I think we need more time, Paul. Couldn't we go a little bit later in the, in the springtime or in the summer? Well, Sergei has already started planning for Paul's visit, but um, I could write to him and ask. Why do we need more time? December's present. I know why you don't want to go. It's because of our marriage. Our <laughs> <laughs> um, what? You're afraid we'll... Oh, maybe it's best if I left. Sit down, Madeline. Yeah, everyone knows about our marriage. <laughs> Let's settle this down. No, you don't want to go because... I didn't say that I didn't want to go. I said not now, when for the first time in years, we are happy and, and content. I mean, truly happy, and, and not for some show or to convince the world or ourselves. We are in a good place right now, Paul, and I just, I just don't want to upset them. Nor do I. I see. It was an old divorce, remember? I mean, we got back together, stronger than ever. And I intend for it to stay that way. I just don't see how this trip would, would, would threaten that. I mean, I'm not saying that this trip would threaten our marriage. I'm just asking, why can't we go a little bit later? That's all. It's, it's no big thing. The opportunity might not be there later. Besides, I need a change, Essie. I'm tired of playing defeated Negroes or stereotypes. I want to do more substantial work. This could be that opportunity. Playing Toussaint is a good role. It is an important role. Dessalines. Toussaint's successor would be an even greater role. While well, Toussaint started the Haitian Revolution, in the end he was betrayed and became its victim. Napoleon captured him and threw him in prison. Jean-Jacques Dessalines, his successor, remained free and completed what Toussaint had started. You speak for so much authority. <coughs> Do you know that you would make a great political leader? Don't you think so, Essie? Yes, if politics means the art of persuasion, Paul can convince anyone to do anything. I'm an artist first, not a politician. But you would be good at it, and there are so few effective leaders with integrity. I'm not ready to commit myself to politics, not now. I mean, being an artist requires tremendous concentration and discipline. And what about your people? Do you mean Americans or people of color? It is not my duty to help America become a more imperialistic nation. <laughs> As for my people, why certainly I'm going to help them destroy social oppression, but I can help them best through my art, by accomplishing outstanding work. Paul, you are having a political impact, whether you admit it or it not. It would be foolish for me to make speeches on the color question. All right, maybe politics is not the right word. It's that you care about human suffering and injustice and that you use your talents by your own choice to stop it. I mean, you might dismiss what you've done as not as important as your art, but it is. Madeline, all of my life people have been telling me I am a man of destiny, that I would be a great Negro leader. But you are, Paul, you are. What I do comes naturally, it's a part of me. It should not be seen as anything other than that. But what you call natural is not natural at all. That is what I'm trying to say. Paul stands, walks towards the front door, and then turns around and Paul walks back to the table, sits back down. This news about Russia is just what the doctor ordered. Madeline, you're an agent. Oh, I have been hoping and praying that you would say yes. Sergei really wants you to come. I wouldn't turn it down for the world. Oh. But I really don't know much about Russia. I, mean, I recently began to read and learn about their culture and language. The trip itself would be a, a learning opportunity. But how are we going to get there? Well, 
That would be a great question for Madeline. Now I have no idea. Does this mean I see that you are on board? For December? Yes. As I said, I'm not against going to Russia. In fact, I think it's a great idea. But can we even travel there in the wintertime? I mean, with all that snow? Well, you can't go by boat to Leningrad because the ice freezes in the harbor until spring. So, uh, the best way to get there is by train through Berlin. Berlin? You'll have to get off and take another connecting train to Moscow. There's an eight-hour wait period between trains, so I suggest that you book a hotel room where you can rest and gather your luggage until the Moscow train arrives. I'd love to see Berlin, even if it was for a few hours. Well, Berlin has changed. I wouldn't stay there longer than necessary. Because of the Nazis? They are very bad news. <laughs> After Hitler intimidated the German people and stole the election, he has now turned the country into a police state. He's rounding up Jews and communists. Germany is not the same as it was. But really, Madeline, how much different can it be? He's only been in power now for, what, one year? Berlin cannot have changed no, that much. No, don't know. My associate, Freddie Kerr, he works for the American News Agency. He was threatened because he wrote an article claiming that the right to start fire was started by Nazis intentionally. I was in Berlin visiting him at the time and spent two horrible days waiting and fearing that they would come and beat him up. But, but they didn't. Instead, they resorted to other tactics. What other tactics? Well, you know, the usual things. Um, threatening phone calls and visits by officials asking annoying questions about his passport, his identification papers, who his acquaintances were, his activities. Then he was followed everywhere he went. So was I until I left. Oh, to make matters worse, his Jewish friends were begging him to help them get out. When I got home, there was a group of Berlin Jews waiting outside my apartment. Refugees stranded in London. When I asked you folks, we got funders to help them. Do you think that the Nazis would come after us? <laughs> no, certainly not. I mean, you won't be there long enough. <laughs> You're right. This calls for a toast. I want to toast the good Lord, who has been so gracious to me for granting me much personal success at a time when many of my brothers and sisters are suffering through a great depression. I didn't know that you believed in God. Of course I do. <laughs> How could I sing the spirituals unless I had some faith? <laughs> I'm starring in a successful musical. And I'm happily married to my beautiful wife. I want to toast to you as well, Essie, for putting up with me for so long and for all of your support. I also want to toast our son, Paul, as well as your mother, my mother in law. I feel truly blessed that I have such a wonderful family. I also want to salute you, Madeline, for bringing the best news yet of the year. <laughs> that we have been invited to the Soviet Union. I toast you and Sergei Eisenstein in abstention. I not only accept his invitation, but I eagerly look forward to meeting him in Moscow. <laughs> and the lights fade. Act 1, scene 3. The inside of a hotel room downtown in Berlin. <coughs> right there lies a huge bed behind, which is a large window with a shade down. Immediately below the window, to the left, is a chest of drawers, from which lays a pocketbook, a small open suitcase, and telephone. Downstage, right, is a door leading into the hallway. Center, left, is a chair, and further down, left, another door. Presumably a closet. And yet another door leading into the bathroom also. <laughs> oh! Oh! 
pulls up the window shade and looks down toward the street. He is dressed in a suit and loses his tie. For moments he stares in silence, almost in a daze, watching shoulders mark fast. Essie, Essie coolly elegant, sitting on the chair. As the marching sounds fade, Paul opens the window, letting him cool the fresh air and the usual sounds of a large city. He breathes in. As these young men in brown shirts with the arm, who are they? I don't know. Some kind of police? Police? I don't think so. Even in Mississippi, the police. No, not in broad daylight. They wait until dark. They put on hoods. It's not just those men. Everyone it seems out there was staring at me. You could see the hatred in their eyes. Did you feel it? Some, some yes, but not everyone. Mostly they seem frightened, caught up in their own personal anxieties and fear. Paul takes off his tie as he gets up and hangs up her coat in the closet. But you should be used to that living in New York. <laughs> Cities are pleasant places. Remember when we were walking in Chicago and during the tour of 26 when that car of whites drove by yelling racial slurs at us and that nonsense? We were offended and angered, but it didn't stop us from walking. This is different. I can feel it in my bones. How is it different? I'm not sure if I can explain it. It's a feeling. I haven't felt it before. The intensity, the loathing, that gives me shit. You don't see it because you look white. He untucks his shirt. Please don't start that. Not now. You have got to stop blaming me for how I am. I'm not blaming you. I'm merely stating a fact. White people are threatened by me, a dark skinned Negro. Why do you deny that? I'm not denying that some white people feel threatened by you, but you're always reminding me about my skin color as if I were complicit in it. That's because sometimes you take the white man's point of view. So do you, Paul. So do all of us. That's the impact of European colonialism all over the world. And now, white fascist world. There's nothing here for me. Nothing at all. Honey, let's not ruin our trip. We are only here for one day. And then we are off to Russia, where you will be honored and celebrated. If we can ever get to Russia. What time does our train leave? 7 o'clock. As he goes into the suitcase and takes out a newspaper. That's a long time. She reads it. There's a movie playing about Africa. A documentary film by Carmen Roosevelt at the Alexander Platz. The next show is at 1.30. Do you want to go? I'd like to see it, but not now. Not in this city. It's right down the street. We've got eight hours. I'm ahead. not leaving the hotel. <laughs> well, why not? It does not feel safe here. I mean, the whole city seems like a bastion of hate. That's silly, Paul. Why are you so paranoid? I can't stay in this room all day. You can go ahead. I'm not leaving. This is not like you. Fear has never prevented you from doing anything. Why now? It's not a question of fear. I'm just being cautious about safety. Paul, it's only a few blocks. No one will even see us. As if you want to go, go. Then go, okay, but I'm staying here. In America, we have racist hooligans in our streets. We have mobs, but that doesn't stop us from going out, from living our lives. What's the difference here? In America? In New York or Washington, whites are used to seeing Negroes. Here I stick out. I'm more of a talk. Nonsense, Paul. When we were here before, we saw Negroes in Berlin. Remember Sam Woodings back? That was then. This is now. But how did you know you haven't even seen the city? You know, when I was 17, I went to Times Square. Times Square? On New Year's Eve, me and my teenage friend from Jersey. What are you talking about? In our room, you could see the crowds. 
A massive surge crashing through the night. I refused to leave the hotel. So my friend scolded me for not going out. He told me I was scared of him, that I didn't like people. I relented and plunged into the drunken revel. My friend was soon torn away from me, caught in an undertow of madness and blind force that swept me into an alley where, 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 where I could not escape. You know, I was trapped there for a long time, feeling that my life would easily end. It was the worst feeling in the world. Well, it doesn't surprise me. Despite your outgoing nature, you are uncomfortable around people, especially crowds. Maybe that's why you're so extroverted, to cover up your shyness. That's not true. I'm not shy. There's something deep inside of you that resists Oh, all. come on, Essie. Then what is it? You're the same way after a performance when strangers come to see you backstage. You run away from them or, or become emotionally distant. It's not what you think. I mean, yeah, you're right. I don't like large crowds, especially when they're unruly or drunk. Even when they are shouting and screaming their love for you? Oh, crowds are fickle. I mean, those mobs at Times Square, they were supposedly friendly. But if Pat accepts them, they'll trample you to death. I mean, it doesn't matter if they love Paul Robeson. The same thing happened when I played football in college. I've heard it a thousand times. Then you should understand how a mob functions. What it's like to be double teamed and triple teamed, the quiet tired squad piling upon you because a black man is carrying the ball, buried under a pile of beefy white boys, unable to move, pinned to the ground. Someone calling you a dirty nigger. Someone else jabbing his cleats into your spine. I've known mobs too, battling Bullies on my school playground. Well, it's not the same thing as with the kids on a playground. <laughs> <laughs> it is the same thing if you're a kid. You don't know how terrified I felt. Yeah, terrified, but not helpless. Yes, helpless when you're surrounded all by yourself. Look, I still want to go out. I refuse to let anyone make my life miserable. Who's stopping you, okay? You want to go to a movie? Go. <laughs> I'm not going without you. We are a team. I thought you said you weren't going. I'm not. I'm just going down to the store. Do you want anything? <laughs> no. I'll be back in a few. Let's see! Be careful. And there she goes. Paul glances at his wristwatch, and the lights fade. Act 1, scene 4. The lights come back up. We see Paul and Essie in the hallway, outside their room. She is limping slightly, her left arm around his shoulder. She is visibly shaking. He is clinging to her waist, helping her walk. They stop at the door. He takes out his key and opens it, helping her slowly to the bed. Essie lies down. He takes off her coat, placing it on the bed next to her. He sits next to her, holding her hand. Essie, Essie, you okay? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, Paul. I'm, I, I feel much better. I'm just a little winded. Are you sure? Did you want some water, something to drink? No, no, thank you, sweetheart. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Did you see their faces? No, no how could I? I was, I was too busy running. I'm glad you decided to come see about me. They were both young, like, like teenagers. One of them had a scar on his cheek. He looked like an animal. I should call the police. Well, what good would it do? I don't know what. Maybe others have been assaulted, you know. Assault is against the law. I mean, even in Nazi Germany. He picks up the phone, begins to dial. She gets up from the bed, takes the phone out of his hand, and puts it back on the receiver. It's no use, Paul. They're long gone. Besides, I'm not sure why they did. Maybe they were prostitute? I don't know if it was sexual. Did they say anything? Maybe they didn't like the way I was dressed. Maybe they were trying to rob me, or maybe they just don't like foreigners. I'd feel better if we told the police. What police? Where are they? All, all I see is brown shirts. Remember that fundraiser I did? They came from here. Who? The Jews. They were from Berlin. After my performance, I was talking to one of the lads. He was saying the police were in with the Nazis. That they work together, that they're behind all this anti-Semitic violence. We shouldn't trust anyone, not even the authorities. I wish we had known about this. 
someone had warned us. I mean, nobody seems to care about what's going on inside Germany. Lillian said something before we left. She warned us about the Nazis. So did Emma Goldman when she came to visit. She mentioned there were pogroms in Poland. Yes, yes, I know they did. But I didn't really think about it. Just like that Jewish fellow at the fundraiser. I didn't think about him until now. I mean, it's one thing to talk about it, another to experience it. It's hard to believe Germans are not like this. They're so disciplined and, and civilized. You are a trained scientist, how? But people change so drastically. My anthropology classes didn't prepare me for this. They were too busy talking about primitive people and savages. <laughs> the sound of marching jackboots grows louder. It's heard from outside. All goes to the women who look out as he goes into the bathroom. More brown shirts. As he emerges from the bathroom, she's wiping her eyes with a towel. When we were here before, the, the workers and the trade unions were, were organized. They marched in the streets. Where, where is the left wing? It seems as if they had vanished. Maybe they didn't want underground. Underground? The left, maybe they're still here, but not in the open. Paul, why don't we invite someone over? Have them come here, someone who can help us understand what's going on. Sure, that would be great. Who do we know? Do you have any, any friends or acquaintances? In Berlin? No. As he takes out an address book from her coat pocket, rifling through his pages. You're so popular everywhere. Mm -hmm. What about Max? Max? Max Reinhardt? Yes. I have his number. He's not here anymore. He moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> What about, uh, what about Herbert? Herbert Cohen? Herbert Cohen? I don't know any Herbert Cohen. Yes, you do. He, he came to see your show. He came backstage to get your autograph. Oh, yes. The Jewish fellow from Vienna. He took us to meet his mother and knew all about my music. I wonder if he's still here. <laughs> it would be great if he was. Maybe he can make some sense of the matter. Why don't you try and reach him? As he picks up the phone and dies, the lights fade and come back up, and we are in Act 2, Scene 1. As he lies on the bed, propped up by pillows, looking tall, he is pacing. He's in his trousers, socks, and undershirt. Every once in a while, Paul looks at his wristwatch, or he stands by the window, which is open, looking out. I wonder what's taking him so long. He'll be here. You don't tell something happened. He said he'd be here. How did he sound on the phone? Nervous. His voice was. Paul and Nessie freeze as the door is. There's a knock on the door. Paul rises from the bed slowly, carefully, opens the door. Hurts cold. <coughs> He's carrying a brown briefcase, which he holds possessively into his chest. He has the movements of a hunted man. He comes into the room, looks around to make sure it's okay. When he finally recognizes Paul and Essie, he puts the briefcase down, sighs with relief, opens his arms, and smiles. Paul Goldson, my dear friend. I hope you're still my friend. Of course. Why wouldn't I be? <laughs> Here, let me take your coat. Oh, no thanks. I, I won't be staying long. You remember my lovely wife, yes? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, she came with you that night after your great performance in Emma Jones. Uh, Mama really liked her. She made Mama laugh and enjoy herself. <laughs> I really liked her, too. Sitting like a queen on that beautiful corduroy cat. Why, well, I never thank you both for coming to see us. You don't have to thank us. The pleasure was ours. No, re really, you, you didn't know who I was when I came to you backstage. And, and Paul, you were such a star. I was a nobody just to avoid you. <laughs> such kindness doesn't exist anymore. I, I never told you. I also came to hear you sing spirituals in Vienna a year earlier. I, I took the train from Berlin. I was in the audience that night. Oh, that was a wonderful concert. <laughs> the audience had me in tears. No. <laughs> Nobody knows the trouble I see. <laughs> Nobody knows the trouble I see. Glory, hallelujah. Suddenly, Herbert notices the window 
the room is suddenly dark as he turns on the light. I was followed here. Yeah. Followed? Good goodness sake, what for? Well, the city's in the world. Why did you come to Berlin? We're going to Russia. Sergei Eisenstein. You know him? Sure, as a filmmaker. All of those montage images. <coughs> lots of battleship attempt. He invited me. Wants to talk about a new film project. We couldn't get a direct train to Moscow. I wish you could have gone by boat. Berlin has changed since I last saw you. But it wasn't so bad four years ago. I thought it was one of the most beautiful cities I'd ever seen. Rich with culture and alive with new ideas, writers and artists. Good musicians and theaters. The people were friendly. Why should we have come back here? Now, Berlin was an exciting place. Yeah, everyone wanted to be here, said even Jews. Does that bother you when I say that? Jews, yes, even Jews came to Berlin. Now Jews are leaving Berlin. Now. Seek her, seek her, to be heard everywhere. Now nobody likes the Jews. I had no idea. Our response to this hatred has not been uniform. But uh, there's a very known joke about our limits to our being German and Jewish. A joke? Yeah, it's about two Jews who tried to assassinate Hitler. Yeah, they, they learned that he drove by a certain co uh, corner at noon each day. And they waited for him there with their guns in. Are you serious? Uh, at uh, precisely noon, they were ready to shoot, but there was no sign of Hitler. Five minutes later, nothing. Another five minutes went by, still no sign of Hitler. By 12.15, they had started to give up hope. My goodness, said one of them, I hope nothing's happened to him. <laughs> 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 I wish the bastard was dead. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? I was accosted in the street and we can't even leave the hotel. Yeah, me too, I was assaulted. But why, Herbert, why? Because I look Jewish. Kind of Jews even Jews, some Jews don't like. Well, who are those brown shirts and the armbands? On our way here from the train station, some of them shouted racial slurs at Paul. Oh, so you met the essay. The who? The stormtroopers. Brown shirts. Hitler's private army. Where are the police? <laughs> the police? They are the police! <laughs> I'm a band of thugs, beat up people they don't like. Well, what is their objective? I mean, why do they hate? It's completely insane. Well, Hitler wants to exterminate any group who he deems inferior. Mm. Jews, blacks, gypsies, homosexuals, mm. the mentally ill, even Russians. The stronger races have a right to destroy the weaker races. The survival of the fittest. Exactly. He wants to exterminate the Jews like America destroyed the Indians. But in America, we can do something about it. Most white people don't think that way. I was telling Paul <laughs> earlier that there must be Germans who oppose the Nazis. Surely there are good people alive in the streets. Germans who used to come to my tailor shop. Good people who were my clients, who spoke to me and smiled when I passed them. Now they turn, the, they turn away as they boycott me, so I can't make a difference. Uh, last month, my uh, good friend, Ruth Larson, high school teacher, was ordered to teach Nazi propaganda. Before her class, she told her students she wouldn't do it, that she would rather kill herself. The next day, she blew her brains out as a gun. That is how one of the papers. I know that is a gun. Ruth would never kill herself. She was murdered by the SA. I have the evidence to prove it. Or, when you see Eisenstein, you've got to tell him what's going on here. You've got to speak out. You've got to help us. Sure, 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 Herbert, but what, what can I do? I'm an artist, not a politician, you know? I'm not really- Then you must get political, Paul. All art is war. No, Herbert, I don't believe that. I, I mean, and I'm surprised that you believe it. I use art to promote peace. In Negro music, there's no expression of bitterness or revenge, even though we've suffered. That is why people listen to me. That is why you listen to me. In the mirror, Paul, do you think people will let you forget you're a Negro so long as there is race prejudice? Maybe it will get better. 
Maybe the Nazi movement will go away. Oh, don't get better. The only way to stop it is by force. Can't you get out? I mean, the things are bad and leave. Go to Paris, you know, come with us to Russia. Where can I go? My tailor shop is bankrupt. My mother, my mother needs medical care. I have no money. What about Vienna? You know, I could go to Vienna, but it's the same thing happening here as happening in Zelda. There's no place for me to go where it's safe, except in America, and only the rich and famous can go. <coughs> oh, one day they'll come to me and then say, Say. Open the door! They're looking for me. Open the door, police! Where can I hide? Open the door now! Just, just, just a minute! We're coming! Paul and Nessie remain parallel. Herbert runs to the closet and goes inside, closing the door behind him. Essie walks to the front door and is about to open it when Herbert runs out from the closet. Apparently, he's forgotten the briefcase. He takes and runs back to the toilet closet, but the kid changes his mind. He looks at the window, runs to it, opens it, sticks his head out, and looks up toward the roof. He climbs out onto the fire escape, closing the window behind him. <laughs> Act 2, Scene 2. Two stormtroopers in the brown jacket uniform with red armbands displaying the cross, brown boots, and holster with revolvers. Stand. They stare at Essie for a moment. Then they walk up to Paul and look him over, not saying a word. They are baffled by Essie and Paul and don't know what to make of them. The second trooper stands staring while the first breaks away and looks around the room. He sees a suitcase on the chest of drawers, walks to it, rifles through Paul and Essie's belongings. Another few seconds elapses before he speaks. Paul. Identity papers. Paul takes out his passport from his pocket as he removes hers from her pocketbook atop the chest of drawers. They give them to the stormtrooper. Paul and Essie resume clinging to each other. In the process of examining the passports, the first Nazi looks up at Paul and Essie, making sure their passport photos match. Who are you? What are you doing in Berlin? Paul replies in German. I'm a professional actor. On my way to Moscow. We had to make a one day stop over. Why would the Russians need a Negro actor? <laughs> <laughs> are you going to make a film? As yes. you move closer to Paul. Yes. Why are you with him? The Stormtrooper 2 runs his finger through Essie's hair, then grabs it tight and yanks her head back, hurting her. Taking her head away from his hand, Essie. I'm an American, I'm his wife. What are you, Spanish, Italian? I said, I'm an American. I'm interracial background. I am Negro, American Negro. You look like a Negro. <laughs> Both my parents had Negro blood. My father looked Negro, he was quite dark. I am also Indian, Dutch, Jewish, Greek, Philippine, Latin American, and Korean. And while you're at it, throw in some tomatoes and pickles on rock. <laughs> oh, you think we are playing some kind of game here? Racial categories are childish. All of my life, I have fought against color rules. You are in Germany now! You must adjust to our rules! Where did you learn to speak German? Are you a communist? I told you I'm going to Russia to make a movie. We are not communists. The first stormtrooper begins rummaging through the suitcase again, pulls out a book. If you are not a communist, what is this? To Paul and Essie, from your friend Emma. It's from a friend of ours. Emma Wolven, a communist. She was born in Russia. She's not a communist, she's an anarchist. <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> Socialist, anarchist, nihilist, or liberal. All of them are the same. The anarchists are worse than the communists. They are believing chaos and disorder. 
He takes the book from the stormtrooper and flips through the pages. Then he snaps the book shut, throwing it in the trash can. Essie walks to the trash can and takes the book out. She puts it back in her suitcase. Who were you talking to when you first entered? I heard a man's voice. No more. Just the two of us. I heard another voice. Your mistake. No! I heard another man's voice! Well, look around if you want to. There's no one here but us. Stormtrooper 2 is eager to search. He looks in the bathroom. <laughs> Herbert is not there. He opens the closet door, looks inside, and he walks to the window, opens it, and is about to climb out to the fire escape, but he is stopped by the first stormtrooper who has changed his mind. He gives Essie and Paul back their passport. <coughs> what time does your train leave? Tonight at 7 o'clock. Make sure you're on it. He heads for the door, the second stormtrooper following. Just as they are about to leave, the first trooper turns. There's no place for Schweitzer mentioned in Berlin. Ooh. And they do go. Ooh. Outside in the hallway, then out the fire escape. Then why did you stop me from going? You'll grab him late. We need to get him alone. Black. Mm -hmm. Act 2, scene 3. Herbert has emerged from the fire escape, briefcase in hand. Walks to the front door, puts his ears to it, and listens. Then he opens the door. No one is there. The vent that the two Nazis had indeed left, he closes the door and goes back into the room. You see, you see what I am saying? I, this is what I go through every day on the verse. I have never seen such loathing in a pair of human eyes. Not even in America. They would have shot me. They saw as he was white woman. He touched me like I was a whore. I did not realize how bad things were. It's horrible what's going on. That's why you have to help us, Paul, outside of Germany. These are documents, evidence we've been collecting, affidavits, letters, Newspaper articles, photographs, even essay reports. This is the proof we need to convince. Who is we? I mean, where did you get this information? I used to work for the SA. What? I was a paid collaborator. I gave some information about the Jewish community. I'm not proud about it, but it was something I had to do to survive. But I said to you before, I was true. I was attacked and harassed like the other Jews. But all that stopped when you started working for the Nazis. I changed sides, yeah. Then you turned against the Nazis. That's why they're after. I was torn between saving myself and watching the society and my people deteriorate even further. Watching my friends get slaughtered, becoming alienated from my Jewish identity. I, I couldn't live with myself anymore. So one day I stopped cooperating. You see, it's the SA uh, after me to get these documents back, which I don't but even more so because I, I turned on them, betrayed their trust. I meant the lost words. Does this mean you are no longer a traitor or what? I'm confused. Well, I, while I was working for the Nazis, I joined a resistance group and began working for them and stealing information from the Nazis. Now, it didn't take long for the SA to figure it out. That's why I am not alone. That's why those are saying that. What is the group you joined? It, it's a small uh, underground cell operating in Berlin. The Nazis have been efficient and brutal and wiping out our opposition, but there are still some of us. Our focus now is to get the facts out to support our ranks. Now, like you, most people don't know who Hitler is or what he is doing. These testimonials and documents will change that. Does your group know about your background? No. You mustn't breeze a word about it to anyone. What I did is in the past, I want to keep it that way. What do you call yourselves? Our name is not important. To them, we are called the New Beginner. That's a report on Jews who have been killed by the SA. Businessmen, university professors, doctors, lawyers, teachers, any of those who have had any type of leadership position. We have even have a confession by a man who claims the essay started the Reichstag fire under orders by Hermann Goering. 
We have to organize against Hitler. If we are to survive, and I don't just mean the Jews, Hitler has stopped at nothing until he's conquered the world. So the threat is real, and we must expose him. All we ask is that you take this briefcase with you to Russia, or wherever you go, and show as many people as possible what's going on. Will you help us? Herbert, I want to help, but it's too dangerous. I mean, if we are caught with these on our possession, I don't know, Herbert. I just don't know. I don't think I'm the right person for this. I mean, you need someone who's more astute in this sort of thing. Well, oh, oh, you're an international star. People listen to you. You have friends in high places. We need your voice now more than ever. Herbert, I know you mean well, but you overestimate my importance. Hold your attention, He gathers all the papers in his briefcase and closes it. We can get someone else. You're too valuable as a... I do. Don't worry, we will find someone. It's just a matter of time. Who will you get? I, here you are, you went to Russia, you called me up to come by for a friendly visit, and what do I do? I bring you travel. I, I come to your room and ruin your trip. I, I bring the stormtroopers to your door and expose you. Mm -hmm. I ask you to get involved in dangerous activity. It's, it's not right. I, it's too much of an imposition. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Leave the briefcase. What? Are you serious? I'll take it with me to Moscow. And what about me, Paul? Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I see. I'm sorry, but... If you get caught, you'll be arrested or, or, or even killed. If that happens, what am I supposed to do, Paul? If I, too, might get arrested or, or killed with you, and we get shot, if we get shot, what happens to our son, Polly, or what happens to Mom? Paul, oh, Bessie, it's, it's okay. Forget it. I will get someone else. It's not okay. <laughs> not as long as innocent people are dying. Nothing is more important. Not my music, not my acting, not my trip to Russia. Not even your own family. To try to do something to stop this horror. Leave the briefing, Trevor. I will take you to Russia. I told you not to go. I said we should wait until the spring. 1934 was supposed to be our year of healing, our year of peace and happiness. I knew something was going to go wrong, but you said no. Now this trip is going to threaten us. Paul, think about what you're doing. I have thought about it. How could you? You made up your mind in less than a minute. <laughs> Don't I have a say in the matter? Paul, I'm not ready for this. I'm scared. So am I. Then don't do it. Look. Why don't you go back to London? You don't have to come with me. I mean, there's no sense in both of us risking our lives. And no, no, no. Don't you dare put me in that position. That's unfair of you. You have no right. I say I'm truly sorry. I have to do this. I came with you to go to Russia. I cannot turn back. If you go, then I go. Are you sure? Leave the briefcase, though. We will take it with us to the U.S. I, I, I don't know what to say. This is more than I expected. You don't know how much clearly this could help us. How can I do it? Is there anything that you want to do? Would it be possible for, for us to meet some of your friends in the, in the resistance movement? Some of my friends? Yes, our, our train doesn't leave for a while. And I would really <coughs> like to get out of here. And, meet someone else other than these Nazi thugs. <laughs> it's taken a chance, I know, but, but it might be worth it. 
I was headed to a small home in the airport right today after I left you in a basement apartment not far from here. Would you like to <coughs> watch it? Right. I, I've heard of you. You could watch the play and afterwards have a discussion with the cast. You can meet some resistance members who are part of the production. May, maybe get a better idea of who we are and what we are doing. Paul, is, is that something you like? Sounds good. Fine, then why don't we... Oh, no doubt those spoons are still somewhere around. Uh, I'll walk ahead about 100 meters so it won't look like that together. Once we get to the location, I'll make sure every single <coughs> report is inside, then I'll come out and signal you. But we, we don't have to walk about right down the street. Okay. If you see any of say, you can warn us to avoid them. If we see anything coming from the rear, we'll see what we as well. Right, we can't be too cautious. Paul puts on his clothes, all of as he put on the coat, he takes a pocket book and the chest of drawers. We probably should take the suitcase, or just in case anything happens. Oh. As a precaution. If anything does happen, we must get on that train tonight. As he takes the suitcase, Paul takes the briefcase to the server. They turn off the lights and they go. After two minutes, <coughs> in the basement of the apartment, dark with one of or two weak electric lights. Four or five chairs, a radio, and a desk with a telephone, and a swivel chair behind the desk. Otherwise, the stage is in the same or small basement window upstage sitting. A small shaft of light going through a crack <coughs> of a curtain. Brett is seen pacing the floor. <coughs> he hesitates. Greta, open up. Are you there? It's me. Greta peeps through the peephole, opens the door, Herbert, Paul, and Essie enter. Greta stares at Paul and Essie. What's the matter, Greta? Why didn't you open the door? These are the friends I told you about. <coughs> the great singer Paul Olsen and his wife Islander who are on their way to Russia. Please, call me Essie. Yes. Hello, Greta. I'm honored to meet you. But you shouldn't have brought them over here. It's too dangerous. What do you mean? You told me there was going to be a hassle. Where is everyone? I sent them away. There won't be any rehearsal. It's a bad idea to come here. But they wanted to meet some of us in the resistance. Greta, what's wrong? What's going on? They killed Hans last night. What? Not Hans, are In the SA barracks, they beat him to death. They picked him up only two blocks from here at the Odeon Cafe. I don't believe it. Oh. God, not Hans. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Somebody we know somebody. I am so sorry, Greta. I am so terribly sorry. Who, who is Otto Hans? Hans Otto, he was... Uh... One of us. He was one of us. A brilliant actor, known and loved throughout Germany. He was very reckless and bold and kind and passionate and a staunch anti-Nazi. You know he was being followed. Someone with his prominence would be. Yet he continued to meet with resistance fighters openly as if he was invincible. The SA are closing in. We could be next. That is why I sent everyone away. It is too dangerous for any more rehearsals. Did you know you are being followed? Followed? Oh, I didn't see anyone. <laughs> An auto, a green Mercedes. It's parked across the sea, the street. Go and look. All of them go to the basement window, pull the curtain back to look out. 
could see the Mercedes. No, there's nothing. Well, they were there earlier. Herbert, you know who I'm talking about. The same two coons who have been following me. And, and burst into our hotel room this morning. What? Your hotel room? Yes, looking for Herbert. They left when they didn't find him. They stayed in and asked us questions. What kind of questions? If we were communists, why we were traveling to Russia, as the racial backgrounds. They are tightening <laughs> a noose. That's what I mean, Herbert. You shouldn't have brought them here. The Gestapo know all about us. They know about this apartment. It, it wasn't his fault. We, we wanted to come. We knew the risk. Yeah, yeah, yes. We wanted to meet some members of the resistance. And I thought it was the least I could do, given they agreed to take the documents with them. All in Hesse are going to help us back then. They have agreed to bring the briefcase? They are going to meet Sergei Eisenstein in Moscow and agree to give him all of the documents. Yes, it's true. I'm meeting with Eisenstein and probably many others. Uh, maybe the military staff. We'll be sure to let everyone know what we have. Uh, I am surprised. <laughs> I didn't think you would do it. I'm sorry, I, I don't follow what you're saying. Herbert asked our group if he could take the briefcase with him when he met with you. I was the only one here, so I consented. We've been trying for months to find someone, someone with a high profile, who could take the documents to the news outlets so people of influence outside of I Germany. proposed that I ask you Paul, to take the documents back to London. I, didn't know you were going to Russia. I hope that's not a problem. No, not a problem. <laughs> I do feel a little manipulated. <laughs> My apologies to both of you. You've got to realize that we are truly desperate. We must get those documents out of here before more of us get captured. And now that Hans has been killed. That's what I don't understand. I mean, when Paul and I were in Berlin four years ago, the left, the, the communists, the socialists were well organized. We saw a demonstration of thousands of communists and trade unions marching in the streets. How could all of those people just have disappeared? The left wing is dying. The fact that we've been driven underground attests to that. Some of us. Some of it's our fault. I need to say it. Your own fault? Aren't you being hard on yourself? Yes. Two thirds of Berlin's population has always voted communist, social democratic, or center left liberal. You're right, Desi. The Nazis were a minority. Except for the villages and towns in the country. In the 1930 parliamentary elections, the communists and the social democrats split into two opposing groups. I should know. I was a communist, and we did not associate with social democrats. We hated them more than the Nazis. But why? I assume social democrats, like socialists, believe in many of the same things as communists. Social justice, internationalism, peace, human rights, democracy. Beliefs are closer to ours, but we're seen as being petty bourgeois, paying only lip service to the, the class struggle. So the left is divided, and the Nazis won nearly 40% of the vote in the Reichstag. How sad. Two years ago, I didn't know that. Because he was a social democrat? Yeah, and I wouldn't have talked to Greta because I believe they were just as bad as the Nazis. <laughs> I myself am from a working class family. My father was a metal worker who despises liberals, especially Jews. I met uh, Greta here in this apartment. I joined the New Beginning movement because it didn't matter who you were as long as you were committed to taking action against the Nazis. So now at least you're working together. Well, that's good. Positive step. I'm afraid it's too little too late, at least in Germany. Our only hope is to get help from the outside, to let others know what's going on. Don't answer that. 
It's been raining for the past two hours. Maybe it's free of wind for it. It could be important. It's the Gestapo, oh, I tell you. Don't answer that! Major walks to the window, pulls the curtain, looks out. You see anything? No. But I don't like it. Something is about to go down. I think you'd all better leave. Paul and Essie stand up, getting ready to go. Paul takes the briefcase and suitcase. He opens the suitcase and forces the briefcase inside it. It's tight, but he gets it inside and closes. He and Essie walk to the front door. I'll go back with you to the hotel. Is that necessary? No, I'll go with you. I've got to go in that direction anyway to Gershaw Bus Hall. And, and remember, if something happens to me, you must go directly to the train station. You must get out of Berlin. Understood. I'll be in touch. We make courageous and strong. Greta embraces Essie and Paul. Thank you, Greta. I'm glad we, we met you despite what has happened. I have learned so much. And thank you for taking the briefcase. It will help us enormously. Please be careful. If the Nazis know what's in it, they will do everything to stop you. What was the play you were going to <laughs> It was a scene from Brett's The Mother. Do you know Brett? Yes, 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 I heard of him uh, through the Jewish refugees in London. Yeah, he does political theater. I would have loved to perform it for you, especially the final scene after <coughs> Felicia Blasova, a Russian mother who has been transformed toward activism, gives a stirring speech on courage in the face of oppression. <laughs> if you still live, <laughs> never say never. <laughs> but look certain is not certain. The way things are will not last. When the ruling class has spoken, the rules shall raise their voices. Who dare say never? Who's to blame their oppression rules? We are. Who's responsible there the rule is smashed? We are. Those beaten down will rise up tall. Whoever is lost fights back. Who can restrain a man who sees his situation? The victims of today will be victors of tomorrow. And never is changed into today. Herbert opens the front door and looks out to see if the way is clear. It is. He gestures for Paul and Essie to follow. They depart, closing the door. Brett is now in the room. Walk to the window. Looks out. And the lights go down. Act 3, scene 1. A room inside the SA barracks. The barracks is mostly empty of men. There's a desk with a chair in the left, hanging from the seat. Two chairs in front of the desk and the door. Stage to the left. Down stage to the left is the entrance door to the barracks. As the lights come up, Stormtrooper 1 comes through the door, followed by Herbert and Stormtrooper 2. They walk to the desk. Stormtrooper 1 sits down in the chair behind it, followed by Herbert in handcuffs. Stormtrooper 2 forces Herbert to sit in the chair while he stands. Where is the briefcase? I gave it to Paul Olsen. I didn't see it with any briefcase, only the suitcase. The same suitcase we sent in the hotel. Where is Robson now? I have no idea. And I wouldn't tell you even if I did. We know that Robson is headed to the train station because his train from Moscow is at 7 p.m. today. 
Where's my mother? I demand to see her! Stormtrooper 2 grabs Herbert as he struggles, slams Herbert across the head, with his baton forces Herbert into his seat. You're in no position to demand anything. Now we need to get that case from Robeson. We can't allow him to leave this country with those documents. Let my mother go. She had nothing to do with this. Don't worry. She will be free. Just as soon as we have the British. You can't win! You will be defeated! Nothing can stop our movement, least of our capitalist Jewish bastards and the Horish mothers. Don't you have any sense of decency or honor? You corrupt and destroy everything you touch! You lie and deceive! You murder! Germany used to be a great country! It was the Jews who ruined it! Who treated us, the real Germans, like we were dead! Quiet! We must go to the train station. That should not be a problem. Wilson is a big man. He might resist. We've got guns. If he resists, we'll use force. I guarantee he will keep it up. No guns! You don't need guns! Sit down! One more word out of you and you'll join Hans Otto pushing up daisies. I'll get another man. And bring the car around the front. I'm going with you. Stay here for now. I'll get someone to guard you. The two stormtroopers, two and three, exit off stage. Stormtrooper <coughs> one stands, walking to the door, stage right. He returns to the desk chair. Although well, you're meant not to hurt Paul. Do you know who he is? I know all about him and his fight looking wife. <coughs> Remember, we've got eyes and my friends and now my family. You betrayed everyone who trusted you. Where is my mother? She's still alive in the same place where we put her. You're going to kill her, aren't you? You're going to kill me too. If it were up to me, I would let her go. Then why are you keeping her? There are consequences for treachery. You should have thought about that before. Unfortunately, it is too late now. A stormtrooper's boots are heard outside the front door. The car is ready. We are sorry. The train to Moscow will be leaving soon. Very well. Let's proceed. And the lights black out. Inside a railway station, Paul and Leslie are sitting on a bench waiting for the train to arrive. <coughs> Paul is wearing his hairy comb coat over his overcoat and Stetson hat as he is wearing her elegant black coat with a fur collar and has her pocket book. They have only one piece of luggage, the same suitcase we saw at the hotel. Are you sure? Positive. It was the same two men who came to our hotel room. He must have followed us after we left. It happened so quickly. Try and remember it. Is there anything else you saw? Anything you remember? Paul, I told you a dozen times. Our car came from nowhere, that green Mercedes, and sped right up to him. The two Nazis that came to our room, it looked like the same two, and got out and put him into it at gunpoint. Then they took off. You didn't see anything? I stopped for a minute because there was a commotion behind us. It's covering our rear as we agreed, and you kept walking. It must have happened in a few seconds. I saw the car, but it was too late. Herbert said they were efficient, brutal and efficient. What do we do now? We wait for the train. Let's hope we can still get out of here. The main thing is, I've bought the briefcase. We have something they want. We already know when our train leaves. We told them that this afternoon. So they know where to find us. Maybe they don't know we have the briefcase. <laughs> Unless Herbert tells them. They could torture him. Go, I hope not. Maybe 
Even so, it might take time. By then, I hope we're gone. <coughs> Two stormtroopers appeared. Same dude came to the hotel room. They spot Paul and Hessie hiding in the shadows, watching them. The train will be here soon. What time is it? It's five to seven. Oh, it's a tragedy. It would be a shame if Paul came to him. He was so happy when we first met him. He wanted to be a fashion designer. His mother was wonderful with her tales about growing up in Russia. You know, she talks about speaking English. That's really something. Yes, she speaks five languages. Hebrew, Yiddish, German, Russian, and English. I spoke to her in German. And what about Greta? She was such an amazing woman. Yes, she is. I mean, I wish we could have stayed longer. I mean, there were so many more questions I wanted to ask. If you live, say never. <laughs> what looks certain is not certain. The way things are, at last. You remembered her lives. Paul, something is bothering me about her. Don't you think it's strange that he walked ahead of us? I mean, it's as if he set himself up to be taken. And before we left the hotel, he even suggested that something might happen to him. Yes, 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 that bothered me too. I mean, we should have walked together, which would have given us all more protection. By leaving us behind, we walked right into their trap. It was a sitting duck. Exactly, that's my point. He made it easy for them, it's too easy. And did he not just do essay men? How different they were. The older one, you could see he was not as rabid killer as the younger one was. Yes, the younger one was nasty, rude and arrogant, a white supremacist. There's something not quite right about this whole thing. You must remember what Herbert told us in Hawkins. How he had to make hard choices to save himself. His struggle with his Jewish identity. Oh, politics is complex, you know. That's what I don't like about it. It makes people do irrational things. It turns some people into heroes, others cowards. Paul, are we still going to do what Herbert asks? What? Tell Serge at Eisenstein. Are we still going to show him the brief? For sure. Well, what will you say? Whether they ever conquer Europe is one thing, but the Nazis are a problem in Germany. I don't like what they're doing to innocent people. Killing, discrimination, and kidnapping. I mean, they should not get away with it. I mean, I don't like what they're doing to the Jews. There's no excuse. Two more stormtroopers enter, joining the others, watching. I have never been political, but Herbert is right when he says, I need to speak out. I mean, acting and performing are trivial when people's lives are at stake. I mean, we need to get involved. Stormtroopers begin to approach Paul and Essie. Yes, honey, but not with violence or hatred. Look what it does. It has got Herbert abducted, perhaps even tortured. It has turned the Germans into murderers. Look at what they did to Greta's friend Hans. I don't want you to become like that, Paul. Stormtroopers have formed a semicircle around Paul and Hesse. Paul? Keep still, Essie. Get away from that fight, woman. Paul, Paul, what are they doing? <laughs> Back to Africa. <laughs> Whatever you do, keep still. Go back to America, nigger scum. Black bastard. Gorilla. Monkey. Paul, that's our train. That is how lynching starts. You must keep still and show no signs of fear. But Paul, that's our train. Babu. Where's the rest of our luggage? But the porter's bringing it. I'll try to throw him away. When I do, they can break it for me. They get on the train. Paul, I'm not getting on the train without Don't you. Don't argue with me, Nessie. Or both of us will go down. Dirty nigga! The circle tightens around Paul and Nessie as if to poise to attack. Nevertheless, they continue to taunt as if testing Paul. Paul looks at Nessie and then the Nazis try to decide what to do in a flash. The expression on his face changes from worry and concern to rage. 
His eyes widen as he rises to full height and walks towards the brown shirt, suitcase in hand. Suddenly, they grow silent as he approaches. He walks right up to them, getting as close as he can, and stares them down. As come on, they begin to penetrate the circle, walking toward the train platform. We're getting on that train now! As he grabs her pocketbook and lines up behind Paul. Once he turns and sees she's behind him, he pushes further through the brown shirts. Fearless, they back away and let him pass. As he follows, as they are about to walk off, suddenly, just before they leave, the first stormtrooper pulls his gun and puts it to Paul's tip. I want the suitcase. Open the suitcase. No. Open it. No. Open the suitcase. I said open the suitcase. No. Stormtrooper is still pointing his gun at Paul. Paul clutches at the suitcase, unable to let it go. The trooper begins to waver. Suddenly, Stormtrooper 2 preempts him, pulls out his gun, and points at him. Send out Sutla! Yes. Give us the briefcase or she dies. Don't do it! Don't give it to him! Give me the case? I swear I will. Kill her! No, Paul, don't, don't give it to him. Paul releases his hold on the suitcase and slowly opens it. He takes out the briefcase and hands it over to the trooper. The trooper drops his gun and puts it back into the holster. He yanks the case from Rosen and marches Paul. The other Nazis follow behind in formation. Paul and Essie stand next to each other, watching the troopers march Blackout. Act three. Scene three. Paul and Essie are sitting in their seats inside the train on their way to Russia. Paul stares out the window. Look, did you see? What? What are you saying? We just passed them aside. I think Salvage Madeline's letter. 
<laughs> Those fools won't know the difference. <laughs> well, I didn't notice it. I was standing right next to you. They've captured Herbert. They think they've won. But by the time I'm finished, we'll have much more than proof. From now on, I'm going to fight the fastest, wherever they are. I don't know how to use a machine gun. Nor can I fly a bomb. But I can sing. And I can speak. And as long as I have my voice, by God, I dreamt I saw Joe Hill one night, alive as you and me. But Joe, I said, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. The Cockburn voices Killed you, Joe. They shot you down, says I. Takes more than guns to kill a man, said Joe. I didn't die, said Joe. I didn't die. I dreamt I saw Joe Hill one night, alive as you and me. But Joe, you're ten years dead. I never die, says he. I never die, says he. sentiments about the people of that land. And before that, I expressed a deep concern and a keen interest in the life and culture of African people and their liberation. My belief in the oneness of humankind has existed within me, side by side, with my deep attachment to the cause of my own race. But it was in Berlin. During my brief stay in 1934, that I became committed to the direct political action. Berlin was a turning point. Since then, I have become more prominent in world affairs. I have adopted a viewpoint that includes a respect for fundamental human rights and a recognition for the equality of races and of all nations. Large or small, settlement of international disputes by peaceful means and a respect for justice. These are the principles that have guided me and my artistic expression and principles which I still believe today.